Welcome to episode 32 of Cyclops is Waiting for Me, an X-Men animated series weekly recap podcast. I'm JC, and this is our second of four episodes, which means I'm drinking. And I'm using a bottle opener from a company called Saucy, who is not promoting us, so I don't have a promo code for them. Oh, that, oh yeah, they're the, like the Uber Eats of booze, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> Saucy, hit us up if you want to sponsor the show. Yeah, that one's on brand. I have a drinking problem. <laughs> And I'm Rod. I don't think I have a drinking problem. I have problems when I'm drinking. Is that- you're not drinking, so yeah. I would say no, yeah, you're, okay. you're good. No, you're fine. Cyclops is waiting for me. Is our you place. also don't have another channel called Whiskey and Waffles, so I That's think true. you're safe. We record at John's place, so I drive home. So I generally like kind of like not <laughs> get too saucy before. Oh, hey, I didn't mean that. It just We're going to proactively start billing yeah. them for future sponsorships. <laughs> anyway, don't drink and drive, kids. Cyclops is waiting for me is weekly... Ah, start over. <laughs> You're not allowed to edit that out. You're sober and you did that. Yep. Cyclops is Waiting for Me is our weekly podcast series where we're going back and watching every single episode of the original 1992 X-Men the animated series in their original intended script order, building up to the release of X-Men 97 coming to Disney Plus in the fall of 2023. Yeah, I forgot to put that in the show notes. <laughs> no, I remember. It's in my soul now. Can't wait. A little bit disappointed in Magneto's design, but we haven't seen it in action yet, and I know it's comic accurate. It's comic accurate, and you have to deal with that. There's other reasons, too, but we won't get into that. (laughs) But I'm still excited for the show. None of this takes away from the excitement for the show until I'm disappointed by it in reality. For those of you wondering how we determine the order of the episodes... And why we're never going to be sponsored by Disney+. Plus. (laughs) We utilize the listed... Order and previously on X-Men, the making of an animated series by the lead showrunner Eric Leewald, which is also available for reference on Wikipedia. And John got confirmation from the Leewalds himself at Comic-Con that Disney will be correcting, Disney Plus will be correcting the order on, on their streaming service. So good job. Some quick reminders. We're a recap show about a series that came out 28 years ago. There will be spoilers. If you don't want this episode spoiled for you, Pause the podcast, go watch the episode, come back, and we're going to do our best to avoid mentioning anything for future episodes that we haven't covered yet, which Rod has already ruined by acknowledging that Magneto exists in future episodes. Okay. I was like, wait, where's this going? Don't forget to follow us on social media at Cyclops IWFM Pod on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook. We randomly pop off every now and then on there. Have no idea why. And then every now and then, <laughs> one of our Instagram reels sticks to like 35 views, and it makes yeah, no sense to me. It's interesting. Anyway, but you can follow us on there. And of please course, interact with our Instagram reels because I want to torture Ra that he never can <laughs> stop posting them. It's fine. It's once a week. And of course, make sure to follow us on all your favorite podcast services. Finally, we record these episodes in batches right now. So if we're reacting to any news about the upcoming series, we may be a few weeks behind. Really, though, it was basically just that Marvel is releasing like 900 different things and DC is releasing negative things somehow. The X-Men have now been referenced twice in the MCU. So that's exciting as far as what's related to our podcast. Now on to the show. So today we're going to be talking about season three, episode 15, titled The Dark Phoenix, part two, The Inner Circle. It aired on November 12th of 1994 and currently sits at an 8.0 rating on IMDb. Let's hop in on this episode. Wow, we went through this intro so much quicker than the previous episode. We had had a lot of setup, though. We had a lot of setup. One really quick note, though, for this episode before we actually get to the story part, the previously on X-Men part. Oh, I always skip those at this point. As a as a music guy, there was like a weird effect <laughs> on the previous. The audio had like a reverb on it. I made sure that to t- check in the original episode, it wasn't like that. It's like someone took like the whole recap thing and just put reverb on it. So it was like, ha, ha, ha. It's like, you know, like the what they used to do in like old TV shows when things are in memories is this like long echo and stuff. That's how the previous X-Men was for this one. And it was like, OK, that's interesting. I, I get why. It was just like a really weird thing. I was like, there's something wrong with my TV. So here's how you can tell that Rod and I don't do a great job of communicating before episodes because I am just like looking at him and nodding because all I can think is, why wouldn't you tell this to your co-host so they could see it too? Oh, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. I just thought it was a funny detail. I like pointing out like little like the nuances of the time, you know, that would probably be like polished nowadays. You know? Yeah, the audio idiosyncrasies, is is that what you're you're going sure, for? Yeah, yeah. So little production things. Yeah. So episode kicks off at the X Mansion and Xavier is mentally calling out for Scott, obviously field team leader. You want to mm-hmm. be in touch with your team leader. It's not happening. So he begins mentally probing the doors of the circle club, or sorry, the halls of the circle club. Really cool visual. It was great. It was very first person perspective. You you realize they 
have this like full staff of people that are working yeah. for them and like Victorian maids because it wasn't French maids because it wasn't yeah. like creepy sexy but it was like oh you literally <laughs> you literally have maids working for you okay creepy sexy it's a whole other genre <laughs> I mean <laughs> but I think I think there might have been a reference to some horror movies or something the way they did because it, it was like a fly first person you know because it was like kind of it wasn't just like like walking in like a straight point of view it was like zigzagging around right it was it was like if you tried to imagine what the perspective of the shadow king would have been back in that storm episode of like floaty and moving as opposed to it being it wasn't from the perspective of a person that was actually walking through the halls yeah yeah but the other cool visual is like he starts to get a little too close to the center and as he does all of a sudden the doors lock on him which is a great visual metaphor because it's like oh no somebody who is also a you know at least expert telepath begins putting up defenses against him Mm -hmm. so he can't see further so he realizes oh i need to up my game and he he actually puts on cerebro at that same time emma is amplifying her own computer to like build like a psychic barrier essentially but it's tech supported which (laughs) honestly i kind of dug it because it was kind of pre-cyberpunk like you know i i know that cyberpunk is is obviously super popular now with the game and all the the associated like I literally have a cyber con- yeah. comic book on my table right now. But at the time, the combination of like mental and t- telepathic stuff combined with tech wasn't really something you would have really heard about in mainstream pop culture. And that was kind of what I said in the last episode about liar how yeah about how terrifying Emma Frost is in, in this kids show is just thinking about it and just the way they visually represented it that there's a computer but this woman's telepathy is so powerful that she's able to like combine with a computer especially in the 90s era the the era that literally (laughs) two years prior the entire database of mutants was on a single hard drive (laughs) that was destroyed with a lightning bolt and that you know i guess that was kind of like a foreshadowing things to come because you know this was all within 93 and 94. so this this episode itself aired in 94. yeah and then 99 was when the matrix happened and stuff so this was all kind of like growing towards that like you said cyberpunk like combination of- god there was so much that happened in such a short time frame right. we're really old yeah <laughs> But I, I love that whole idea that not only is Emma Frost aware of what's happening, she has a computer to take care of it, but also her own power, mental powers can combine with it. And it is really strong start to the episode. And Emma's still fucking terrifying. Yeah. Speaking of terrifying. So we are we are within the inner sanctum of the inner circle. Is that that a fair way to, to address <laughs> it? The inner part of the inner circle. The inner inner circle. circle. And the X-Men are all collared. And they also have strengths on their hands. Yeah. And I got a very like Genosha vibe off of it, which is really, it makes a lot of sense, but it's also kind of scary because if those are essentially Genosha style collars, they're owned by a group of mutants. Like yes. the inner circle, not necessarily Pierce, because Pierce is, is cybernetic, mm-hmm. but Shaw, Leland, Emma, they're all mutants. Mm-hmm. So like that's that's an extra layer of the weapon that is used against you becomes your own weapon too. I, I, I feel like, especially as I get older, and even though this is happening in a cartoon and this is a almost a trope in different movies and TV shows, it's probably also like a little bit of a signaling to us in like the civilian sector that it's not just an entertainment, but probably in real life that people who are against, like you said, this type of weapon or whatever, and are in power, are probably hypocritical enough to be weaponizing the weapon that they are against. It happens, like, a lot in different shows and, and stuff, you know? Yeah. Like, like for example, I just watched uh, an episode of South Park that there was, like, an organization that's against time travel. Mm. So they own a time machine to make sure it doesn't happen. I mean, that's a great yeah, like- <laughs> way to prevent time travel. And then it's mutually assured destruction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then the inner circle is basically like, oh, well, why don't we just destroy them? And Shaw's like, no, we're going to keep you guys as lab rats. Like, like that's you, so gross. Yeah. you couldn't have gotten in if we didn't want you to. Yeah. And I didn't realize that until you mentioned it, that they like purposely like let them crash the wedding. Yeah. Yeah. Like- we allowed you to enter. And that point we get the reveal of Gene in the new outfit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What were your thoughts on that one, Rob? Well, now that you've mentioned in the last episode that that was part of like her, it's supposed to be like her ancestors, like embodiment or whatever and stuff. It makes more sense. At least- you mean aside from the fact that she was wearing just like dominatrix gear? Yeah. <laughs> Even outside of that, it was it, this was kind of like the signal, especially because her face literally changed. She got a mole. Yeah, she had a mole pop up, which I don't remember if it appeared in the original comic book artwork. Mm-hmm. I'll find a comparison picture and throw it on the Instagram. But 90s, Cindy Crawford was famous yes. for the mole. So it was like, 
oh, she's evil, but she's also like extra hot. Like yeah. that's how I interpreted it. <laughs> it's like evil equals hotter. <laughs> this woman out on TikTok did the same thing. She was like, uh, basically a lot of DC characters, it's like before and after transformation. It's like, oh, you get hotter and lose your glasses. Like Catwoman, Poison Ivy, Harley Quinn. Like, What's her face from She's All That? Yeah. yeah. So she's like, basically, if you want your eyesight to get better, be evil. If you didn't know it before, this is not Jean. I mean, it is Jean in not, that it's not the Phoenix, but it's not the Jean that was part of the X-Men, if that makes sense. We're like dealing with like two and a half characters now. It's like Phoenix, Jean, other Jean. <laughs> yes, so other other Jean, and I think this might, that's, this might help you. If you actually look at the outfit and you compare it to Emma, mm-hmm. and even though they don't address them by Black King, White Queen, White Bishop, etc. Mm-hmm. If you look at it though, she is wearing the black version of what Emma is wearing. Oh, gotcha. So in the comic, they actually go as far as calling Jean the Black Queen. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Going, makes... going along with the what we talked about in the previous episode of they're essentially the group of chess pieces. I in This podcast is not the place to talk about, but I'm genuinely curious now. I'm probably going to look this up on my own about like what the logic of having opposing pieces within your own organization <laughs> Uh, <laughs> is, you know. I think it's. The, it, I think the concept is to literally keep people in check. Mm-hmm. If you have two kings, yeah, nobody is in full control of the organization. Yeah. If you have two queens, they're they're meant to hold each other at bay to not overtake it. In the current version of the X Men, in the Krakoan Council, there are four different groups within it, and you literally have like you have a Red Queen. I forgot the exact breakdown off the top of my head, but like. I believe Catherine Pride is literally like the red bishop, essentially. Okay. So it's it's a it's a balance of power rather than a full control scenario. It's funny because that makes sense on paper, but as we're seeing through these episodes, it literally just gets them to fight more. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I do think in, in this one though, like that actually may have been a device that they chose not to take because they didn't have to. Yeah. As if you if you just call her Emma and you don't call her the White Queen. Yes. Then by having Gene move into this this black queen territory, but she's the only one you've addressed as queen. You actually prevent that that check from taking place. Yeah, yeah. No. But all in all, yep, we see Gene is now under this, you know, brainwashed side. And then we cut to Wolverine in the sewer. Yeah. So well more specifically, it's please. the it's the thugs like looking through the hole in the floor. Right. And they're you like see, they're, they're you like, see them they're like down. there's no way that he'd survive this. Or like, you have witnessed all these people like in this building do all these things like why is that even a thought in your head that someone couldn't survive like being in the sewer <laughs> like of all the things you've seen <laughs> so as these guys are like debating like oh well, it's gonna stink down there we better go down there and take care of it the shot pans down mm-hmm. and when it does that you actually get one of the most comic accurate shots of the entire series. And that will definitely go on the Instagram. It is one of the opening pages from one of the the issues of Wolverine in the sewer. And I think off the top of my head, I could be wrong. It's one of the, I'm the best at what I do quotes for Logan. Like they don't use that in the show, yeah, yeah. in the comics. That's such an iconic part of him is like, I'm the best at what I do. And essentially gotcha. what I do isn't very nice. So that is that great shot. And it totally brought me back to when I remember reading the the trade for this story years ago. That's so cool. So the two circle guards end up making their way down into the sewer. Wolverine takes them down pretty much no problem. Mm-hmm. And then he comes face to face with one of the other guards. And did you get the reference of what was going on there, Rod? Not specifically. I just caught a vibe of it was like a Tony Soprano kind of moment where he's just like freaking them out, you know. So it's essentially a paraphrase of Dirty Harry. Oh, that makes so much sense. Because it ends with, do you feel lucky? With Dirty Harry, the end was, do you feel lucky, punk? Gotcha. Yeah. So it's a total psych out moment. And then he he drops the dude, obviously. (laughs) But yeah, it was it was definitely like an homage to that dirty Harry speech of I'm going to walk towards you as you have a gun drawn on me. Mm -hmm. And are you that confident you can kill me in that one shot before I get to you? Because if I get to you, you're done. Yeah. Well, also, you thought you drowned me. Like, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I think that one was like the clueless guard. I don't think that that dude had any idea what was going on. Yeah. Oh, that makes Yeah, that's, that's true. Jump back up to the circle club and there's a little bit of a kind of conflict that you were talking about begins emerging where they are kind of questioning what Emma's feelings about everything were because she was the lone woman in the group. Previously, you know, they had essentially accused Jason of if he was trying to bring on Dazzler to be one of their members or was it to like, you know, for himself kind of thing. And it's like, well, are you, are you jealous? 
Yeah, I and I got the sense that Shaw was kind of flirting with Jean a little bit too. Yes, yeah. That, <laughs> sorry, that, I did leave out that part. There's definitely a little bit of like feeling out this person because I think they all realize like this is a weird psyche scenario. This is not a healthy mind we're having a conversation with right now. Yeah. So they basically say, well, like, are you jealous of Shaw because he's the guy in charge? Which was also like that mid 90s misogyny kind yeah. of thing but also like are you jealous of Jean because she's been here for about 45 minutes and she's basically <laughs> yeah. becoming the top dog yeah because like you said they didn't address the chess thing in the show so for all we know she's just replacing Emma yeah and if there's only one single person being referred to as a queen then yeah. Emma you're SOL here and Weingard you know in part of this whole argument is like you know Shaw I can control you too like he's trying to remind I guess yeah, I Even mean, that's kind not- of that was kind of his response to, I think, Shaw trying to, well, Shaw, if Shaw's the king and Jean's the queen, it's mm-hmm. like, maybe you don't want to come on to my girl. So even though they didn't mention the chess thing, you're seeing like all the stuff play out where they're all just kind of like shuffling around the board who's in oh. power at the moment. Yeah, I mean, what what's the the dumb joke online? It's like fourth dimension chess or something. Yeah, yeah, forty yeah. chess. Oh, God, I hate that phrase so much. And this is. I love that I say stuff on the show that I immediately regret saying. <laughs> That will clip out for Instagram. Yes. <laughs> Every week, it is a fucking adventure of figuring out what the Instagram clip is. Because I, I, like I said in the past, I literally look up the episode. I look up an image from the episode. And then I find what the clip is. Yeah. I, I don't I don't ever care if they match up. There's something that wasn't story related, but I noticed as a detail in, the, sure. in this part is, and maybe they saw them before, but I just noticed it here. Even though they're not called the Hellfire Club here because of children standards, reasons or whatever for yep. TV. Yep. Uh, don't, ha- don't have kids say hell. Yeah. They have pitchfork brooches and pins on their stuff. So far, so there's still like the remnants of the Hellfire stuff. Right. Very Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, you know, Gordon Ramsay was a set director. Hell's Kitchen Fire Club. Yeah. <laughs> but speaking of that 4D chess, which yeah. now I'm going to just punch <laughs> myself every time I say it. They actually turn it back on Jason. There are two ways of saying it. Even in the show, they say it differently. Yeah. It's Wingard and Weingard. I just end up going towards the latter. But they actually question like, oh, this love that this woman has for you. Is it real or is it an illusion? I mean... They're all pretty smart individuals. That's just a dig at that point, right? Yeah. Because there's like, there's no way you have convinced this person that they actually love you in 24 hours. Time. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not even at that point. To that point, Emma says, you know, we can't deceive the Phoenix forever. Like, you know, we feel like we won at the moment. But th- reminder, this woman flew into the sun. Yeah. And, <laughs> and this is kind of where Wingard's, now I say Wingard, Jesus, his arrogance kind of pops out because he gave her dark emotions. I think one yeah. important aspect of, we talked about who was what position, you know, who was the bishop, who was the yeah. kings, etc. Jason at the time was not technically a full member of the Hellfire Club's inner circle in mm. the comics. He was essentially jockeying to get one of the positions. And gotcha. he was looking for a spot as I think he was only going to be like a rook or something at that Mm -hmm. point. He's not just entering the circle. He's going for a top dog spot right now. And because he's gotten this powerful piece on his side, he thinks he can dominate the board. Yeah. And he every metaphor of chess I just (laughs) said right there. And he says something kind of gross, but it does a good job of conveying like his character and all those guys actually in the in the inner circle club. But he says that not to worry about them controlling the phoenix because to play to his misogyny he says that she kind of wants it like right he specifically says in this and it's like whether that's true or not it's like that's how he feels it is kind of gross but like right that's his assurance to emma well i i would i would agree based on the stuff that we know about the phoenix and the the context of emotions mm-hmm. is it seems like the phoenix itself is going for the most dramatic emotions yes yeah, so true. you have stuff like love as opposed to like so (laughs) it's like okay phoenix is feeling love whether or not it's legitimate from wingard you have you know anger and like you know the fighting and stuff like that like taking down a friend is like that's a pretty heavy emotion whether it's a good Mm -hmm. one or a bad one it's heavy and i think it's the weight of the emotion that matters whether or not it's positive or negative it makes sense yeah because obviously in the first part where she was in like the the honeymoon stage right 
not to anyway. No, no, that's fair. <laughs> <You're> not, <laughs> I mean, they they no they, they closed the ceremony, yeah. and then it was like technically they're they're in the honeymoon stage right yeah. now. Yeah. So they, you know, Phoenix was like, "Oh, I like this thing where she loves Scott and blah blah blah," and then she's like, "I like I love revenge too." Like, <laughs> yeah, I like making out with somebody in out of spite rather than love. Yeah. We cut to another part of the Circle Club mansion, and you have this dude who I. The way he was drawn, I thought that had to be a reference to somebody. I, I, I could not find anything. There has to be somebody like in the crew or somebody there. Yeah. So right? essentially, there is one of the. He's definitely like a waiter or like a maitre d' type character. Yeah. He's not one of the guards, and he's wearing like you know the the really douchey wig and and. Mm-hmm. But he's very, got like nerdy glasses on. Yeah, he has very nerdy glasses. Yeah. So so that's kind of out of character because everybody else goes out of the way to be like period accurate, and he's wearing clearly like a, a modern to that time, you know. Like, Maybe he needed nerdy glasses. Right. <laughs> Maybe the Benjamin Franklin style glasses wouldn't work for him. Yeah. But he is excited because at this dumb waiter, he's expecting this bottle of wine to be there for him, and Wolverine pops out, yeah. which is the opposite of getting the bottle of wine that you're hoping yeah. for. Well, he got the bottle of wine as well. He did get the bottle of wine. <laughs> and then the only thing in the entire Dark Phoenix saga that is out of character for Wolverine is the fact that he drops the bottle of wine instead of drinking it. Yeah, but he did say it was a lousy year. He did say it was a lousy yeah. year. I wonder if it actually was. Right. <laughs> was, was there like a wine connoisseur within the writing staff who's like, oh no, I'm going to pick a year that is known to have like spoiled and suck. Yeah. <laughs> That's another cartoony moment. Where Wolverine, I like that Wolverine's getting some like more comedic moments yeah. and stuff. So he, he comes across like a turkey and he like- He, he just grabs the leg and yeah. takes a big bite out of it. Doesn't he say like turkey or something like that something too? Something like that. And then he criticizes the way everybody's dressing. He's like, where do you guys, where does it? Where Where's everybody's shop? shop? Drops a few more guards. One thing that was interesting about this guard moment for me is they actually said like something that was like anti-mutant. It's like, okay, are they unaware that the leaders of the Hellfire, or sorry, the inner circle are mutants? That would make sense. Because if you're in a world where it's consolidation of power, could the fact that you're a mutant actually work against you from a criminal perspective because look at you know racism and and stuff like that within early mafia and stuff like if you were even not italian you could not be made in the mafia so if you have something that is even more dramatic of human versus mutant maybe this was like how they rose to power and why i don't want to call it the freaks of it but if the inner circle is a larger worldwide community similar to the way it was with the real life hellfire club is the new york group just a consolidation of powered beings and they got their power through their mutant abilities or their cybernetics but the rest of the inner circle circle club from the other regions don't actually know that they're mutants or half robots that would Makes sense, actually, because well, there's I'm, I'm, I just went on a fucking tangent to get there. <laughs> no, I, mean, I mean, it's valid, though, because I it I'm going to be butchering this quote or sentiment, but you know what I mean? It's basically that the only thing like more powerful and more dangerous than a lot of power is the power that the other side doesn't know you have, you know? So it's even if it's just the inner circle that has the powers, right, you know, and if just nobody else there, even the New York chapter doesn't know, and they just kind of like work in the sh- more in the shadow, like the shadow of the shadows or whatever, you know, because right. the circle club's already in the shadows and the inner circle is like, well, Emma Frost has a leg up if no one knows that she has telepathy. Right. She just uses it. <laughs> well, to, to that point, though, like the people that are in the circle club, mm-hmm. but not within the inner circle, because you like even in the previous episode, there was a comment of like you made a pledge. Yeah. Like, so there is a level of secrecy and trust that is only within this group of of, of yeah. the inner circle. So are there just like rich politicians that these are where the politicians are going and they're taking the bribes? Let's let's go down yeah. that route. Emma could be just manipulating people of like, oh yeah, see, we just put $2 million in your bank account and they don't know that $2 million was not actually put into their bank account. So there are ways of manipulating without them seeing the power. And I mean, that's also kind of your your ultimate trump card is you have an incredibly powerful telepath. So if somebody accidentally sees the mutant, maybe they don't realize they saw the mutant. Yeah, and they have the, you know, wind guard, wine guard, like, yeah. it's like you're in pirate times. <laughs> but that's just on like weekends. right? pay extra for that right extra dues <laughs> jumping back into that that main inner circle circle room you have everybody around the table and they give a toast to the new queen mm-hmm. and cyclops so i love this scene because what's happening to them in the real world is kind of innocuous they're literally just sitting down for dinner and toast 
with people with power yeah. inhibitor collars right next yeah, to them. With next to them. Yeah. But as far as the real world goes, pretty uneventful. Yeah. But what we see here is we see Cyclops starting to talk to Jean like telepathically. Mm-hmm. And Emma senses it and then goes in to combat Scott in Jean's mind. And also Win- Wingard is there too. And so this battle starts. But the well, dinner is just continuing. To be clear, Emma doesn't go into the mind. Scott and yes, Wingard, Wingard go in. Yeah. yeah, but Emma senses it and like I, it, it implies that she sets up, she facilitates the battle somehow. Like, or she's just aware of it. I yeah, mean, it could get interpreted way. different ways. Yeah, so they're, they're in Jean's mind, Cyclops specifically, and then Wingard pops up and he pulls off the glove and gives the classic like slap across the face of yeah. like, I'm challenging you to a duel. And then, you know, they, they basically go into like old timey pirate outfits and such. And Scott can open his eyes because yeah. in this not real world, his mutant powers don't mean anything. And I, I think this is kind of a testament to Wingard's like pettiness and stuff. Maybe somebody who knows history accurate stuff could point this out or not. But it seemed to me that he purposely put Scott into like like a lower class old timey garb. <laughs> yes, I, I would agree with that. It was definitely drawn to be like more of like a commoner or a sailor. Yeah. Whereas even just from a color perspective, Wingard was in like royal colors. Like yeah. there was like a blue and a purple and stuff like that. And it was just like tan on Scott. <laughs> yeah. But speaking of Petty, as they're, they're having this like sword fight and there's the duel, Wingard actually makes an X across Scott's chest with his yeah. sword too. He called him like, the, you're the X, X-Men or something. Puns, you love puns. One thing, because it is within a, like a mindscape, astral plane, whatever you want to call it, the world starts manipulating around Scott too. Mm-hmm. And he accuses Wingard of using it, basically being like, well, it's easy when you can cheat. And Wingard's response is, I'm not doing this. Gene's helping. helping. Yeah. Then Gene actually shows up in in the mind battlefield thing. Well, Cyclops starts to get the upper hand, and then mm-hmm. Wingard just disappears as soon as that starts to happen. And that's when. So we we've, we've addressed it a little bit about Wingard Wineguard. Yeah. Gene says Jason Wineguard, and that's where I made notes. Like I think that's oh. why I kept saying it because of Gene saying it. Yeah. I'm gonna go with Gene. So uh, I've been saying Wineguard because at that point I was like, is that how you're saying it? So like. But before this, we've only Wingard. heard yeah him being referred to as Wingard. So I guess a little bit of apology there if you got confused, but sure you figured it out. I feel <laughs> the need to apologize to anybody that that is their real last name. Right. <laughs> and that's all. Cyclops can't believe that it's it's Jean and she's doing this and attacking him and stuff. And Jean says, I think you have the exact quote, but that she, she's something to the effect that she's freed from sympathy and morality. And she's been given access to, quote, the dark joy of dis- devastation or destruction. Destruction. Yeah. My notes look like a four-year-old wrote them. <laughs> and at that point, Wingard comes back. Wingard, um, n- now there's right. Mastermind comes back. It implies that he stabbed Cyclops. You don't see it again. Standards yeah. and practices, you can't literally show somebody being stabbed in a, in a cartoon. But it cuts back to the real world. And in the real world, you see Cyclops drop. And everybody's worried that he's dead. But in fact, he's essentially like passed out. He hasn't yeah. actually been killed. And everybody's surprised, not only because they thought he died, but once again, you know, to them. It's just dinner. Yeah, they were just watching some rich folk have dinner. <laughs> and they and they kind of point that out because you just see the over the shoulder of Emma, like Emma's shoulder yeah. while they're at dinner. It's like, oh, none of them are moving. Everybody's just like <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> having this battle. And for all we know, we don't know how time works either. Yeah, it so, could have all happened in a split second. Yeah, like in an instant. I, I love that scene because it's like, oh, wow, all that shit just happened. Like Speaking of which, <laughs> this is a huge tangent. Currently in the Marauders book, which uh-huh. is Kitty Pride's team, okay. one of the new mutants that got added to the team in this volume of the book has the ability to essentially bring everybody into a mindscape and could slow down the transference of time. So if everybody got blasted out into space and they need to like figure out a plan of like, how do we fix this? In less than a second, like hours happen within the mindscape. I just that just That's made me think cool. of that. I yeah. don't remember the name of this character, it's but like, it's, it's it's like timeout in sports. It's essentially it, <laughs> it actually it is timeout and saved by the bell. Oh yeah, yeah, it was Zach Morris. Yeah, except, <laughs> he, except he can pull other people into timeout with him. Yeah, so Cyclops, we, like we said, passes out in real life. Wingard, somebody asks, like, oh, is oh, he dead? Emma, Emma checks and is basically like. Well, no, he's not dead because Gene is still psychically connected to him. Mm -hmm. So the trauma of the death in the mindscape wasn't enough to kill the body in the real world. Yeah, but Wingard thought 
it was because he says, well, the, the body can't live without the mind. Yes. So I like <laughs> this dude is just not winning anything. He's, he's being shot down by everybody. He's <laughs> such an arrogant prick, and I don't ever want to see him win. So but, Shaw challenges yep. Phoenix to go ahead and destroy Scott. It's almost kind of like a... Uh, For the circle. It's yeah. like a rite of initiation, like prove kind of, yourself kind yeah. of thing. Almost like when you're getting into like a frat or something or a this is club a, or something. Yes. Instead of doing like keggers, this is the way for the inner circle to to do their rush. Um, yeah, there you go. It's the inner circle rush. So it looks like Gene is actually going to make the move for it. Wolverine jumps in. And then did you get the other reference that happens in this episode from Wolverine? No. Here's Johnny. Oh, why, why did I not get that? It's it's essentially a here's Because I can moment. hear it now, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately for Wolverine, he gets sacked. Yeah, by Gene. <laughs> yes. Yep, yep. <laughs> At that point, Wingard basically like, look, look how much power I have. Like, they can't stop us. And he essentially pulls a power play on Shaw of like, she's more powerful than the entire inner circle combined. And I control her. And that again goes to your like... Mm-hmm super douchebaggery of him yeah. and the first person to side with wingard is leland and he's basically like i'm sick of your bullying go <laughs> fuck yourself pierce don't really know why maybe he's just mad he had to pay for the crystal that got broken in the last <laughs> episode but he sides with him too and then shaw turns to emma and emma gives like the best bitch response ever like you know what you made your bed you wanted a new queen now you have her yeah, so got and they the, all give the thumbs down. Yeah, unanimous voting out. At that point, you get a you know a little bit, even though it's not as strong as the psychic rapport of Cyclops and Gene. There is a rapport between Gene and Wolverine, and we get the flashback of the most meme tastic episode ever, <laughs> yeah. where it's Wolverine recovering in his karate gear. Gene walks in, and you know they have their moment of you don't have to go. And it's Cyclops is waiting for me. (laughs) And then it's so am I. That's what causes Gene to regain control. When we picked the name of the show, I don't think we actually realized consciously, maybe subconsciously we did, Mm -hmm. but I don't think we realized how much that phrase continues to be brought up throughout the series at various points. I definitely didn't. I barely remembered it was in the series until you mentioned it. Yeah. And I think we both, to some extent, just got tired of thinking of options. (laughs) I also hate puns, which yeah. is the number one thing. Like almost every idea was like a bad X pun and I was not yeah. here for it. But that provides Gene control. And at that time, Wingard commands Gene slash the Phoenix to destroy Shaw. And Phoenix jumps in at that point. Freaks out. She's like, I can't be controlled. Yeah, it's essentially like, I'm tired of your petty squabbling amongst yourselves. I'm out. <laughs> Which, fair, because that little room of that inner circle is so annoying to watch because they're kind of fighting about nothing. (laughs) (laughs) But they're fighting about everything at the same time. They're fighting about a lot of power, but in a very broad sense. Yeah. Just doesn't really matter yet because there's no specific goal. They're just arguing about their own internal politics. I don't think you know how rich people work, Rod. Well, I'm... I I think that that's stupid, too. So at that point, the X-Men are able to break free of their restraints, and that's where they kind of switch up their tactics and and start trying to fight back around the Mm -hmm. inner circle. You get guards that arrive, and the circle members like kind of all go their separate ways. It's kind of like the ship is sinking, and it's everybody for themselves kind of scenario. So Scott zaps Wingard through the ceiling. Gambit and Storm start to fight Emma, and Rogue goes after Pierce. Right. Beast gets Shaw but he's having a little trouble so storm ends up having to freeze him again so a few things that do happen in that time frame cyclops runs off to go find gene beast tries an alternate method of taking down shaw where he's essentially on his back and with his feet juggling shaw yeah. and it's a method of finesse rather than you know kinetic power i think beast kind of forgot that finesse is fine because he's not generating power from his feet touching him but he's also creating kinetic power of the second that he stops, whatever impact there is, is going to generate yeah. kinetic force. But yeah, to your point, Storm is able to like freeze the entire room, essentially. And Beast is like, you couldn't have done a heat wave? He's like, no, because it's the opposite of what we wanted to do yeah, here. Yeah, he would not help here. He would actually be bad, sir. <laughs> also, um, you have fur. Wolverine definitely wants some revenge against Leland. I think he calls him Fat Boy or something to mm-hmm. that extent. And he dives onto him as Leland makes Wolverine denser. So Leland just basically, imagine somebody throwing like a bench press weight at you. Yeah. But as they're throwing it at you, you added more weight to that bench press. 
I wish that they would have clarified that his powers were density before this because all of this makes so much more sense. Because my note was just, oh, Wolverine tackled him. But this makes so much more sense. My favorite of all of it, Emma just escapes out the front door. <laughs> she's got some, Turkret, she's got common sense. Everybody yeah. was like, are we don't have to fly through a skylight? Just right there. No. Nope. I, I had a note that this this whole fight scene was really well choreographed, especially for an animated show in the time period it was. Because... We have multiple fight sequences in multiple locations. They're all connected in like a chronological order and they're interacting with each other accurately. Right. And it's, it's which there's there's live action movies that don't do that. Yeah. And this was really cool. And it was a pretty lengthy fight. Like it wasn't just like a it, one yeah, blip. Like we're, you know? we're kind of glossing over it a little bit to an extent because the excitement of a fight scene doesn't usually translate well to a podcast. Yeah. But no, to, to your point, it was like A hits B, B hits C, yeah. D and E are hitting <laughs> each other. And then A and E cross paths. It's like it's a very hard thing to coordinate. And, it you know, both in live action, but especially Within cartoons, we we were used to seeing like two people fight each other. Person, you know, defeats other guy, and that's kind of it. Yeah. Kind of thing. At that point, Shaw essentially sees his opening, and he pops through a hidden door. A classic bookcase. Yeah, yeah. Like, he, <laughs> he has the evil lair bookcase, which. I mean, if I was going to be a rich supervillain, I would totally have evil bookcases. Yeah, exactly. This is how you know I'm not a supervillain, Rod. <laughs> in my house, there are no bookcases that are built into the walls. No, they're just into the tables, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And then at that point, Rogue goes at it with Pierce and rips his arm off. She's like, I'm tired of this shit. I love the cartoon concession you have to make. Rogue rips the arm off. And instead of ripping the arm from the muscle and tendons yeah. and skin that would probably rip off first, it's just the robotic arm and not a guy who's going to bleed to death almost instantly. That should be the next, like, one of the next things they do in, like, the future seasons of The Boys is a show like a cyborg-type character get their limb ripped off, but more accurately. So it's not just the metal parts that break. Yeah. It's like, yeah, the flesh is softer. Yeah. So you'll see that. <laughs> well, it's kind of like Bucky in Winter Soldier yeah. has the arm that just kind of pops off easily yeah. as, like, a safety mechanism to prevent that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After he loses his arm, he is able to get a little bit of a head start against Rogue. He pops in through another hidden door, and you get the we are coming back between Pierce and Shaw as mm-hmm. they make their escape, and they fuck off, and we don't have to worry about them for the rest of the episode. Up on the roof, you see Wingard is going to Gene, and it does not go the way that he wanted. No, oh, he because he in his head things play like he's not considering who she really is, and more of like how he imagines yes. her and the situation to plan out play out and he doesn't like adapt <laughs> i think the piece that wingard is missing is he thinks the power was all his mm-hmm. whereas i would say it was the phoenix is still building its own power so it's not at its strength yet mm-hmm. but also it was being amplified by emma oh yeah and he doesn't have that all without time. emma to to boost it He's so arrogant about his own power that he thinks he can control a celestial entity. (laughs) So long story short, the Phoenix, it it has figured out, you know, the indoctrination, gaslight, you know, whatever you want to call it. Right. And it's like, that ain't working anymore, buddy. But also, thank you for unlocking the thrill of that evil. Like, that was the... (laughs) That was the line. I'm like, oh, it's it's dark. It's really dark. <laughs> yeah, and so she says she thirsts for more more of that thrill. And, so she blows away his illusion. Right, which was done awesome in a visual effect. It was like a shattered glass image. Mm-hmm. And that's where you see what the real mastermind looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's kind of like super like aged and aged uh, and homely. And like, I got the impression his hair was very much like straw and such. So you had this like, though douchey, very dapper looking like, you know, Victorian style dude. And it's like, oh, that's why the illusion is there because if he tried to walk into the inner circle, even if like whatever you want to say about any of them, they're very refined. Mm -hmm. They would have never considered him him if he looked like that because there's not only are they evil, but there's also a level of superficiality around them as well. Yeah, especially to be in inner, inner, the upper echelons of the inner circle, or whatever, the inner, inner, inner circle, whatever. (laughs) There's only the one inner circle, Rod. It's the circle club with the inner circle. The room is confusing. We don't know what the room is called. Anyway, he's ugly now. Yeah. Um, But then, you know, as as like the extra like F you to him, the Phoenix is like, well, no, now you get to see me for what I truly am. And you go into this like psychedelic like experience of, him being pulled out of reality and he's kind of like floating in space. What that was supposed to embody from a visual perspective was this is what it feels like to be a god. 
And but like, and, it, and it, it's the whole concept of to be a god, you have to have the mental capacity for it. And if you don't, it's going to break your psyche, which is why when it finally zooms out, he's like drooling. He's breaking. Yeah, yeah. it, it kind of reminded me of an Indiana Jones when you like look into the, the, the yeah. uh, Ark of the Covenant, you know, and you're yep. just like melting or whatever. Right. But yeah, I love that. And right about then, Scott finds them and he's trying to intervene as well. I think he thinks he has a case with Gene. And still thinks that that Gene has some semblance of control. And essentially the Phoenix is like, nope, <laughs> not, not immortal anymore. I'm the Dark Phoenix. And that's the first time I believe we hear the phrase Dark Phoenix. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's like the Phoenix itself has gone through a transformation because it realizes it loves to what it alluded to earlier of the dark impulses. Yeah. And then it has that great, like almost apocalypse line where it's like fire made flesh. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty awesome. dumb. Yep. It's pretty. And then I love the whole Scott's like, no, as like the giant screech <laughs> is happening from yeah. the bird. Yeah. And then the to be continued. I know we say this all the time, but being straightforward episode, but like, it was really solid. It was great. Good stopping point. It you know? felt like a comic book yes. in, a, in a very good and positive way. Mm-hmm. Like there was lots of big stakes here. There was, you know, some of the, the idiosyncrasies of a villain and how they're approaching a situation and they let their petty bickering <laughs> get in the way of actual success and things yeah. like that. Because I would imagine if they didn't start talking about the Phoenix in like the I control them kind of way, they may have stayed along for the ride because it's like, cool, I get to stay and do evil shit. You yeah. Know? There's a there was a lot of points where they're like, if you just maybe been a little more upfront about things, probably would have played out a little bit better. Yeah, for you. you actually probably could have just <laughs> been like, hey, do you want to be evil with us? Yes. Yeah. I love killing people. <laughs> so I don't know. Great, great episode. And second, to be continued in a row that didn't have PowerPoint effects. No. <laughs> No, there were no PowerPoint (laughs) effects. On that note, thank you guys for joining us. If you have any thoughts, make sure to drop them into the comments in either YouTube, the official Instagram post. And if you like what you heard, we would appreciate a rating on the podcast app of your choosing. Apple Podcasts would be dope. I just actually heard about one of our friends. They do a podcast called Red Web and they've hit 100 episodes and they just got on the new and noteworthy page on Apple showcasing that if you do get a groundswell of people who, who give you comments and love, it can help. I don't think we're ever going to get there, but it's a good goal. (laughs) Never know. On that note, I don't really have a good outro, so thanks. (laughs) Bye.